One of the most successful entrepreneurs in America over the past 50 years is going public with his fourth and final prediction about a scenario he calls America's nightmare winter. You've probably never heard of Bill Bonner, but in addition to owning an interest in businesses all over the globe, he also owns more than 100,000 acres with massive properties in South America, Central America, the US, plus three large properties in Europe. Bonner says, we're about to enter a very strange period in America, which could result in the most difficult times we've seen in many, many years. Bonner has made three similar predictions in his 50 plus year career, and each one proved to be exactly right. Although he was mocked each and every time. That is why I strongly encourage you to read about Bonner's fourth and final prediction, totally free today. It's all spelled out in a free report we've put together about America's nightmare winter scenario. Get the facts for yourself. Go to AmericanWarning2022.com to get your free copy of this report. Even if he's only partially right, it will dramatically affect you and your money. So again, www.americanwarning2022.com. Welcome to Making Money. This is Matt McCall. Thanks for joining me. It is the 20th of December, closing in on Christmas, a beautiful Tuesday down here in Baltimore. We got a big show coming up for you. It's part one of our predictions for 2023. And I have a special guest joining us. All that coming up right now on Making Money. Again, this is Matt McCall. Thanks for joining me. It's the 20th of December, 2022. And it it's a Tuesday here in the home office in Baltimore. This week, obviously, it's a holiday week. A lot of people are traveling. But, you know, as much as we were going to reflect on what happened in 2022, it's very important to look ahead to 2023. As I say often, it's very difficult to drive a car looking in a rearview mirror. We must look out. And nobody's a crystal ball. Nobody can predict the future. And I always have trouble calling these predictions, but it's really kind of looking out using historical numbers, using trends that are going on right now, and where you think those trends will be in the future to help determine what the market could possibly do next year and what trends could be the best uh, performers for investors. So in today's show, we're going to take a look at some big asset classes. Uh, we're going to take a look at oil. We're going to take a look at gold, uh, solar, so certain areas that not all may be pretty, and not every prediction is going to be bullish, but we're going to look at different trends that I think are very important to you at home as investors, break those down and help you prepare your portfolio for 2023 and beyond. So I'd like to welcome a special guest, his first time here on Making Money, Drew McConnell. He's my right-hand man right now, my lead researcher here at Stansbury Research. Um, thanks for showing the show. Yeah, Drew. thank you very oh, much. You've been trying to get you on forever even though you sit right next to me. Um, but you and Nick, our other researcher uh, analyst, helped me put together these predictions for 2023 this year. And we chose 10. I mean, we had obviously a lot that we talked about, but we chose 10. And we're going to go through five this show. Then on Thursday, we'll do five as well. But these five, are, they're pretty exciting because they cover some big areas that can be a bit controversial at times as well. So prediction number one, and these are in no specific order just for everybody at home. We're going to talk about today. Um, I picked this one, Drew, number one, because it's a topic that if you ever read the comments, which I try not to anymore, <laughs> uh, they tend to bash me every time I talk about gold. And, you know, you look back in 2022, gold had an okay year. Uh, as a matter of fact, heading into today, gold was down about a half percent for the year. So it was flat. The argument that some people would say, well, the S&P is down double digits, so it actually really did well. Well, I go back to May of 2020. That's when the CPI was 0.12%. 0.12% right. year over year. Uh, we're now above seven. We're above what? Eight and a half at some point, almost yeah. nine, I think. Um, highest level in about 40 years. So since that time frame, since we bottomed on the CPI in May in 2020 till now, gold is actually up 3.9%. When the gold bugs and the people backing gold would always say, it's the best inflation hedge out there. And again, you may say, okay, it was, it was up during that time when CPI went up, but not as much as I would think. Then let's take a look at SPY, the S&P 500. During that same time frame, up 26%. So actually stocks did much, much better than gold. And then of course, let's take a look at Bitcoin. Even though Bitcoin's gotten crushed this year, still up 73% in that time frame. So again, 
from when inflation bottomed to where we are today, it went from 0.12% over 7%, gold's only up 3.9, stock's up 26, and Bitcoin up 73. So my prediction is that it's going to be another boring flat year for gold in 2023. What say you? Yeah, and I, I'm with you on that. I mean, I think that it's hard for people to to accept. <laughs> a lot of people that like gold, they love gold. And I get that. I mean, I understand that people are tied to certain assets. But the reality is it just it hasn't done much. Mm -hmm. And in my view, I'm looking at it the same way you are. I'm saying that it's it's been stuck between about $1,600 and $2,000 an ounce. And it just is trading back and forth between there. And yeah, I mean, it's done okay this mm -hmm. year considering how the market has performed. But with the dollar up and, you know, and with stocks down, I'd rather be in stocks moving forward. And I think you're right. It's just, it's probably going to be more of a quiet, slower moving asset this next year. Yeah. And if you look at that 3.9% since May of 2020, so that's what, two and a half years, give or take, about right, almost exactly two and a half years, you actually would have lost money with inflation. Right. Inflation just would have lost money because inflation was up much more than 3.9%, as we just mentioned in that time frame. So it actually would have, would have been a loser for you. And you take a look at cash. Cash wasn't paying much, but you got a little bit. It, it's probably not really outperforming just sitting in cash either. And you're taking much oh, yeah. more risk with gold or any asset class versus just sitting in cash. Um, but again, if you sat in cash, you lost money too because you had inflation going up. So right. there's really not a lot of places to hide. But again, you go back to, to the stocks and stocks were up 26%. So even inflation adjusted did much better than, than any, most other asset classes out there in that time frame. Right. And that's why, I mean, you've always said that you've got to keep that long-term view that <laughs> you're yeah. not buying stocks just for tomorrow or for the next day. And, you know, if you look at the numbers, it's just that stocks have vastly outperformed. And so I'd rather be in something that's going to go up, you know, 20% over a few years than do nothing. And, and you know, it's crazy. A lot of people, when, when inflation started taking off last year, you know, they, again, pushing for gold, saying stocks underperform in inflationary times, but that's really not true. A lot of times during inflationary times, stocks actually hold up pretty well. Right. Obviously, certain sectors do better than others, but um, historically speaking, if, if you're in good quality companies that can um, handle the price increases coming in and push that um, price increase to their customers that have good business models, they actually do pretty well during inflationary times. Yeah, and that's something that might worry me a bit as well. If I'm big in gold right now is what if you know we're right and inflation does come down significantly yeah. over the next six months to a year then that entire case is gone right yeah. so then you're just hoping that the price goes up yeah but and it's just there's no real um catalyst i guess right i guess the one catalyst that i can see moving gold because i think and nothing goes flat it'll be up and down throughout the year probably and flat is uh a u.s dollar so the U.S. dollar has really rolled over, broke below its 200-day moving average recently. So if that continues to come down, over time, there's been an inverse relationship. You know, as the dollar goes down, gold yes, goes yeah. up and, and, and vice versa. Uh, so we could see that help push it a little bit, I'd assume. Yeah, that's possible. I mean, I, one thing that I've looked at a lot is the dollar tends to turn around the beginning of the year. And so it's some people call it the January effect. I don't know if you've ever heard yeah. of that or not. But we're coming into that where the dollar has been coming down actually for the past few months. And so it's possible that we could see a dollar turn back higher here at the start of the year. Which would not be good for gold. No, exactly. No. Yeah. So either way, again, I, I'm not bashing gold. I'm not saying you shouldn't own gold. That's uh, that's up to you, um, your personal preference. Some people just feel safe having 5% of portfolio gold for whatever reason. They feel right. safe. You yeah. know, some people like 5% cash, whatever it might be. Keep doing what you're doing. I'm not telling you to stop. Uh, all I'm saying is that according to the charts, according to the catalyst that drive gold historically, probably going to be another flat year. I yeah. just don't see big upside. Yeah. All right, so let's stick with another commodity. This commodity had a hell of a year uh, in 2022, and that's oil. And uh, our prediction number two here is that oil will uh, remain elevated. Um, you want to kind of go along? Yeah, absolutely. So right now, oil's at about 76 bucks a barrel when we checked in earlier this morning. And we've, we've written about this a decent amount lately and our team has been working on a lot of research on this and right now with everyone going back to travel and with china possibly reopening there's a lot of reasons that demand is ticking up mm -hmm. but in general demand has stayed high yeah. even though output has gone down because for years with prices you know even going negative yeah. <laughs> the other year there's just been a lack of investment in the space and yeah. so you've had rig counts that are way down from their peak so companies aren't drilling mm -hmm. for new assets and you've got to drill often to replace what was being produced before. Mm -hmm. So we've had years of underinvestment there, and now demand is possibly starting to tick back up again with China reopening and whatnot. So there's a lot of reasons to be bullish just purely on that. Yeah. Then we look at the Strategic Petroleum Reserve. I had just checked the numbers earlier, and there have been 345 million barrels drained out of the SPR. 
And so whatever you think about that policy yeah. or not, that's about 50% off its all-time high. So those barrels need to be filled back up at some point. It's just been a straight drop off. And just to explain, SPR is um, where they store oil that the government buys for instances like this during COVID or um, you know times where the prices go up, demand is there to try to keep prices down and lower the energy costs for Americans. It's, you know, it's kind of like their strategic reserve. That's yeah. what we needed. So, yeah. But we've lost half of that. Right. It's, it's been drained half. And then there's been some prediction that they're going to start buying again at around 70 bucks a barrel, $75 a barrel. So we're in that window. Mm -hmm. And you can't just have the SPR be drained down to zero because it's also meant for war. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just a preparedness thing. So yeah. um, it, they're going to have to start filling it up at some point in the near future. And as prices come down, it just becomes more and more attractive to do so. So there's quite a few things that are coming together. And then I know you've been looking at just the consumption from other countries that they typically rely on a lot more fossil fuels than um, other forms of energy. Yeah, I mean, I'm gonna talk about that in a second, but you talk about, you know, if it comes down to 70, 75, the government, you know, there's talk that they'll start, you know, um, re, 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 uh, rebuying for the SPR. That to me tells me there's a natural floor because if it gets down to a low level, you're gonna see the buying. Because again, yeah. they have to, you know, put more back in there. If they're smart, I'm, I'm betting the government makes a smart decision. They're yeah. buying at seven. They should have been buying back when it was single digits, literally, uh, in 2020. Uh, they did not. But so that means there is a demand that comes down and hits a level. It's supply, demand, boom. Yeah, it's, you're going to be buying in. And the supply is not going to be able to keep up with that. So prices go higher. Yeah. So you have a, yeah. a natural kind of catalyst at some point, probably early 2023, where we do see that that happen. Uh, you know, money, people start coming in. Yeah, and I think you'll be able to see it happen. You know, if, if prices can't really break below $70 a barrel, you're going to know that it's happening, yeah. that they're buying. And they're going to be buying in such big quantities that it's it's going to be hard to hide. It, it is. Yeah, you're so, right. You're right. Yeah, they're not buying. Yeah, it, it's going to come across the tape and you're going to see that. But you talked about, you brought up um, other countries. You know, Africa's got 18 of the 20 fastest growing cities in the world. I mean, Africa's just booming. Average age in Africa is 21 uh, the average, or uh, sorry, median age, 21, median age in Europe is 42. Yeah. So double that. The U.S. I think is like 33, 34, somewhere around there. So very young, um, very educated uh, a country, very hardworking country. Uh, so they have a demand for fossil fuels. And 90% of Africa's energy comes from fossil fuels. Oil is 39%, uh, natural gas is 30, coal 21, and then renewables and nuclear make up about 10% only. So yeah. You're, you know, this is a, a high demand country. Look at India, one of the largest economies in the world. 90% of cons consumption comes from fossil fuels. China, the largest country in the world based on population and the second largest economy, 83% fossil fuels. Pakistan, you don't think about it, but it's a ton of people and it's growing to 86%. So you can kind of get where I'm going here that even if the U.S. tries to wean itself off fossil fuels, there's so many other um, developing countries out there that they, they can't, they're, they're not, they don't have the money for renewables right now. It's not that they're not putting money into it, but they're years away. Yeah, they're not ready for the transition right no. now. And then the, the war in Ukraine has completely changed the energy dynamics in Europe. So now these countries don't want to buy Russian crude or Russian gas. And so that's <laughs> adding a whole nother monkey wrench into the situation, yep. which is going to cause more problems. It's going to be more volatile. So what's the best way to play this? You look at solar stocks, you try just to buy into an oil ETF that tracks oil. Uh, or maybe a little bit of, of everything. So we've looked at a bunch of different things and some of the oil ETFs are okay to invest in for short term and some of them are not as good. Okay. So what we've leaned towards is more of the uh, exploration and production companies. So they're called your E&Ps. Mm -hmm. And those are, there's a, you know, a handful of them that are very well run established businesses. And throughout this last cycle where prices went down so low, they've really had to become <laughs> shareholder businesses that yeah. are targeting, you know, returns to their shareholders and raising capital and having a good balance sheet. And they're not, they're not drilling as crazy as they were yeah. in prior years. So that's changed a lot. And we added one recently to one of our newsletters uh, in the last month. So I, I, I yeah, I, I agree with you. I think um, there is a place for it. And I'll admit going into this year, I was not bullish on energy stocks and they have been the top performers. I don't think I'm alone there. I don't think there's many people pounding the tables we talked no. about earlier <laughs> off camera that's saying buy energy stocks. Now they're going to be up 70%, give or take, this year. It's amazing. Um, I looked at coal. Coal is not one of our predictions, but I looked at coal this morning and the um, Energy International Energy Association, IEA, came out 
and said the demand for coal is going to be the highest ever yeah. this year. Um, and, and then I looked at some coal stocks and I pulled up three large multi-billion dollar stocks. One was up 120%. The other two were up over 80% this year. So right. even beating, you know, oil stocks. I mean, coal is just, it's unbelievable. And that's kind of flying on the radar. And I don't think that trend, Drew, is going to stop for coal, uh, for fossil fuels, for, for oil, for natural gas. That demand's going to stay there, which should keep it elevated, which should help these stocks. That being said, prediction number three, <laughs> we're taking the other side of what we call the barbell approach. You know, the barbell's got, you know, big thing over here, a little line, and, and, right. and a big weight over here. <clears throat> well, one is energy stocks. The other one is going to be clean energy. And, you know, according to uh, basically anybody you talk to, Solar will be the fastest growing energy provider. It doesn't mean it's the largest yet, it still has a long ways to go, but the fastest growing provider. Uh, the, again, the IEA believes that solar will overtake uh, coal energy by 2027. Bloomberg's intelligence expects solar to grow by 20 to 30% uh, this year, between 22 and 2023. Um, any, anybody you look at, anybody does any research on solar and clean energy, the demand is just up, even residential demand uh, for the first half of 2022 is up 35% over the first half of 2021. Yeah. I mean, so you're seeing it not just from large corporations, but um, from individuals as well. So what's your view here on, on solar and clean energy? Is there a place for it? So I, that's why we've kind of adopted this barbell approach where you can get a little bit of exposure on each side and play both of these trends. Mm -hmm. Because the, the transition, as we've said, is going to take a long time to go from clean energy, or sorry, from traditional fuels to clean energy. Mm -hmm. It's not a a quick switch and I think that's one thing that people have a hard time understanding is that it's just it takes a long time to get these projects into production like yeah. an oil and gas project takes it can take years yep and so when you stop for years it takes years to get it going again yeah they can't just like <laughs> turn the spigot back yeah, on people exactly. don't realize that yeah and these solar stocks have done incredibly well this year ever since they passed the inflation reduction yep. act there's a ton of money that is going to be flowing into the sector and you've seen it if you look at like uh, Sunrun and phase Solar Edge. A lot of these solar stocks have held up very well yep. this year, and again, the sector is going to grow at twenty percent per year for the next few years. So there's a huge tailwind that is pushing these stocks. That's why you want to be in both sides of this. Um, you can protect yourself by not only having one side of the energy trade. Yep. And it's something that again, I overlook the the dirty energy versus the clean energy side of it. I always like the clean energy and. I, I don't want people who've been following me for years to think, okay, you don't believe in clean energy anymore. I do believe in clean energy. And, and again, these numbers, the trends, anything that goes from lower left to upper right like this, I mean, it's all, the right. adoption's huge. But again, you have to realize that like solar power is still a very, very, very small portion of the energy that's, uh, that's in the U.S. that we use. Yeah, like it's, it's like 3%. It, yeah, I mean, yeah. it's tiny. Yeah. So if it goes up to 30%, which it will at some point in the future, that's an easy 10 xer At yeah. some point, it's going to be even more than that, most likely. Uh, you know, again, this is years down the road, but to build solar facilities, to build wind facilities, to build the, the grid, what do you need? Yeah, you I need mean, a lot of fossil fuels to build that stuff. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, that's the thing. Like, it doesn't just come out of the sun. Like, you need to build this stuff and, and to build it, to get from 3 to 30% to 10 exit, think about the probably hundreds of billions of dollars that's going to take to do that, maybe even more oh, yeah. over time. And again, you need fossil fuels to run the machinery, to build everything to, to, that we're going to doing there. So the demand's not going anywhere. No, and we're talking about like the infrastructure build out that's required yeah. to build a nationwide charging network for EVs yeah. or, you know, just the grid in general is not really ready for what's coming. Yeah. And so there's going to have to be probably trillions spent. Yeah. <laughs> I would have to guess trillions over. I mean, by the time you're done, easily trillions, yeah. Yeah, easily into the trillions. And I mean, that trillions world word, we kind of throw out a little bit more these days, but if there's an opportunity that has the T word, trillions, there's gonna be a lot of companies making a lot of money, which means there's a lot of opportunity for investors to make a lot of money investing in these companies. Yeah, absolutely. You know? So, so I, I, I love solar and uh, so far, uh, year to date, uh, the um, Invesco Solar ETF, which is simple TAN, T-A-N, it's up about 2% year to date. Uh, s and is down about 18. So it's being the market by about 20%. Yeah, um, and, this, and, and both have pulled back in the last week or so with the entire market pulling back. But, you know, there's a lot of stocks in that ETF that are up, you know, pretty big d double digits that have done really well um, over that time frame. We have a couple in our, in our portfolios as well. Um, one that deals with residential that, that I think is really positioned to have a, a heck of a year next year and beyond. Um, but, yeah, when, when it comes to solar, I, I think it's tough to uh, ignore it. Um, 
it does get lumped into the riskier assets. You know, so like when the stock market pulled back last year, some of those big sell-offs, they got hit. But again, to yeah. still be up 2%, even though they are considered risky, a lot of them aren't making money yet. And companies that don't make money have gotten crushed. So all, you know, with all that stuff in its face, it still did well. Yeah, I think when you consider those factors, they've done very well. Yeah. Because a lot of companies that are not profitable have been beaten down this mm-hmm. year pretty pretty badly. But these solar stocks have held up really well. And some of them are up quite a bit this yeah. year. Um, so it's definitely, there's money flowing into the sector. You can see it clearly. Mm-hmm. I mean, especially with the market being down as much as it is. So yeah. it's been very clear this year that that's a, a trade where people are still comfortable putting money to work. You know, it's one of those things where I, I always like to say innovation doesn't sleep, you know, and, and you know, solar becoming a major, so major source of energy for the U.S. and beyond. That's innovation because, it, you know, it's getting cheaper and better at wafers every year. Um, even though people haven't talked about solar so much outside of the Inflation Reduction Act, which mm-hmm. you know, had to deal with solar and clean energy, we have to remember that even though it may not be a headline on CNBC or in a paper, it's still growing. Right. Again, it's still like I just t- said, residential man, 35% year over year. That's still huge gains. Yeah. I mean, if you look at any chart for solar growth, it's all just lower left up. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and even if it comes in half of what the prediction is, it's still a huge gain. Right. Which the opportunity is still there is the way I look at that. So, you know, sometimes they are a bit uh, outrageous, some of the, you know, the predictions for how quickly something grows. But um, I don't see it slowing down. And I also feel we're not going to talk about it today, but I, I also really like um, for clean energy, wind and hydrogen. And there's there's some statistics about wind that for us to come anywhere close to net zero uh, in the future, wind has to more like five to 10 X the amount of uh, offshore wind energies uh, that that's uh, provided. So I think wind, there's some great opportunity there as well. Yeah. And there's, a, there's not that many players specific yeah. to wind. So there's a couple of stocks that are in that. Uh, Vestas comes to mind yeah. as one of them. But yeah, there, there's not that many. So it is an interesting sector where there's going to be a few a few winners. Yeah, probably. Exa- exactly. Yeah. And and that's been adopted a little bit more overseas than it has here in the U.S. Yeah. Uh, but they just had, I think, um, some type of auction off the coast of California for offshore. Mm-hmm. Um, because offshore wind energy in the U.S. is extremely low right now, yeah, uh, but expected been... to pick up dramatically in the years ahead. All right, so we're going to shift a little bit. This is somewhat of a commodity, but this, this is a prediction that I think is kind of crazy. Um, but uh, Europe's going to will start taxing the meat industry is my prediction. And I did some research, and there's actually a few countries over there that are doing it already. Spain and Switzerland already have a meat tax. Um, proposed ones from Germany, Denmark, and New Zealand. Um, this, this to me is crazy. I get why they're doing this, and this kind of goes in, in, in line with clean energy. Global livestock industry accounts for about 14.5% of all man-made emissions, and it's the second largest producer of methane. So, obviously, trying to get greenhouse gases down, meat production. The problem with this that I see, well, it's a lot of problems, but the, the first problem I see with this is it, it's going to raise the price of meat, obviously, of course, it's, it's, yeah. whether, whether they tax the producer or the, whether they tax us as the consumer buying it, probably a little bit of both. The price goes up. We're already paying a lot for meat. Right. It, it, we could pull up anything right now. Bacon, pork, again, le- or lower left, upper right. Price has been going through the roof. Yeah, we were just looking at cattle prices are near multi-year highs, yes. so it's already expensive. So that doesn't affect the wealthy because, you know, that affects all of us, but who does that affect? It affects, unfortunately, the, the lower economic status people in this country and more abroad. It's not even about right. this country as yeah. much. I don't think we'll, we'll pass it anytime soon. At, at some point, you probably will. But in, in, in poorer countries, people won't be able to eat. So I, I just don't see how something like this happens. I understand what they're trying to achieve here. What are your views on this? I, I feel like it's crazy. I mean, I, I'd be surprised if they pass it through. I think, I mean, it, it's just that, that's a lot. And with prices going up as much as they are, it's going to be a big barrier because for a lot of countries, when they're trying to kind of move from your more developing nation to an emerging or established nation, it's, you see meat production pick up yep. uh, across the board. It's yep. a pretty clear trend. And so putting a big tax on it is going to cause some problems. I mean, the prices are going to be passed on, as you said, either from tax to the consumer or they're just going to raise their prices, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> and, exactly. Somebody's paying for it. Right. Somebody's paying for it. And, I understand that if they tax it to try to lower demand, lower consumption. Otherwise, I'm not. I'm not really sure about um, about this one for for meat producers. But I think that 
we're going to learn a lot more about this in the next <laughs> year or two because they always are passing on these kind of different taxes on food and now with prices going up i'm going to be curious how to see how it plays out yeah i, just, I think the, the the reason i think that we'll get passed in a few of these countries is because there, there's a lot of leaders that all they care about is lowering emissions mm -hmm. greenhouse gas emissions that's all they care about so they'll do anything to try to achieve that and not look at the ramifications of what it has on society right which in this situation yeah. will honestly truly hurt developing countries and uh, people with less money. And that's the last thing we want to be doing right now. Right. Uh, we want to be yeah. bringing people up, not keeping them down or putting them down. So prediction number five, I say this for the end. Um, Bitcoin will bottom in 2023 and start a new multi-year bull market. Um, I believe you wrote this one up, so why don't you jump in? I was going to say, I think we're probably going to be alone on this one. Yeah, I, I know. <laughs> I don't know if anybody is interested in cryptocurrencies today, yeah. which is exactly what you thing, want though. to be buying them. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Um, and we've seen this before. I mean, I, I don't know. You've been investing in cryptos for years. Yeah. I, I've been around the market for a long time as well, and it has these cycles. And it goes from complete euphoria where the prices are soaring and everyone is buying and it's all anyone's talking about yep. to times like this where nobody wants to talk about it. And what you've seen is that after Bitcoin has a down year, it tends to perform very well mm -hmm. after that. So I look back and if you look at the down years, it had one in 2014, it had one in 2018, and then this year will be its third year ever that's down. Mm -hmm. And each of those years, it was down about 60 to let's say 70%. Yep. So a pretty significant drop. Yeah. But and we're in the same we're in the same range this year too, right? right. Sixty to seventy percent. Yeah, yeah, we're right there. Um, but the years after that, it typically would double or triple. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so right now, Bitcoin's uh, I think about seventeen thousand yeah. somewhere around there. And so that's talking about you know thirty four thousand, mm -hmm. maybe even back up to fifty thousand or mm -hmm. so over the next couple of years. And I don't I don't know about you, but I don't know if anyone is really thinking that that's possible no. right now. But you've seen brokerages are going under, which I don't, <laughs> I'm not happy about that sure. for people, you know, having their money tied up and lost, obviously. But that also is a big sign when you're near a bottom. That's yeah. what typically has happened in the past. If you remember Mount Gox, that yeah. whole debacle that happened years ago. Um, and then the last cycle downturn, a couple of brokers went under then too. Yep. And so it, it's the same kind of pattern that's playing out again. And that tells me that we're going to be higher in a year or two. And even if we go to 34,000, instead we do double next year. Um, that's still half of the high. Right. We'd have to double again from there to get back to the all-time high around 69000 So it's not like we're, we're saying we're busting through a brand new high. We're saying you could double your money and just get back to... it's Bitcoin still did be down 50% from the high. Right. And, and that level. But you could double from here. Yeah, and when assets get this beaten down, this hated, yeah. they rebound sharply. Yes. Usually very sharply. Yeah. So I wouldn't be surprised if it happens very quickly too. Yeah. Because it just there's not much. It's not going to take much for Bitcoin to start rallying. All the negative news is already in, right? Yep. I mean, yeah. The only thing, I mean, if there's one more kind of not a black swan, it's called a gray swan that comes out in, in early 2023. Could could knock it. One of my analysts I worked with for years, Bitcoin guy. He he's been saying for since it was around fifty thousand that he thinks twelve to fourteen thousand at the bottom and. I've read that. I see it on charts. It could be between between twelve and fourteen thousand, but that's not much further down from here. So I look at it and say, let's call it fourteen. Seventeen to fourteen is obviously three thousand. It doubles seventeen, so that's a seventeen to three reward to risk. That's a pretty nice setup. That's yeah. five and a half to one. Yeah, you're gonna uh, want to take that most. Yeah, times. exactly, exactly. <laughs> and again, I'm not telling anybody to run out and buy Bitcoin right now if you don't have it. But I do think at some point this year we're gonna see a massive rally in Bitcoin. And again, I don't know if it it follows through for years. I mean, we'll reevaluate as it goes. But again, uh, the chart that we pull up here on the screen, it shows how after 2014, uh, it wasn't just up for one year. The next three years were up over, well, over a thousand percent. You know, same thing, 2018, next three years, well up over well, probably six, 700% right. or so. I mean, yeah. you know, it's, it's huge gains. I mean, yeah, huge, huge, huge gains. gains. So uh, big, big, big upside potential uh, in, in my opinion. Um, you know, just think back, you know, it was at $3,000 in 2019, people were giving up on it. You know, the bank's saying it was dead. And then, what, two years later, it was at 69000 right. You know, just think yeah, about just that. Goes, it can change yeah. that quickly. Yeah, and 23 times your money yeah. in, in two years. Yeah, what do you, do you have any opinion on what regulation would do for the industry? I mean, there's been a lot of talk about, I mean, a lot of the senators yeah. and Congress people have come out and said that they want to add some. I, I personally think that'd probably be good for the industry, honestly. Yeah, all the conferences have gone through the last couple of years. People have spoken with. Um, I've given a lot of speeches in front of uh, financial advisors that manage, you know, large amounts of money. 
that they never really worried about cryptocurrencies. They're not old school bonds and stocks, didn't really do mm -hmm. much uh, in cryptos. But because their large clients started asking about it, they needed to educate themselves. And the big pushback that I always got when, when I presented it to them was, again, regulation. Because they can't go to their customer with the due diligence they're supposed to be doing and say, yeah, we're going to invest in, you know, in Bitcoin on this exchange or whatever it might be. And that exchange goes away. Right. You know, that's, that's too much risk. They can't take that risk. They'd rather miss out on it than go take that huge risk. So to re reward the risk for them is really not in their favor. But if we have regulation, we will see it open up to larger institutional money, which is the big demand, which will push the price higher. My only concern is I know the government and I know everything works in a pendulum, that they're going to swing from under-regulation to over-regulation. And maybe it's a happy medium at some point, but without regulation, I don't think we see Bitcoin get back to where it was. I, we need to have some, because it's, yeah. it, people are too, too hesitant right now. I mean, you've seen it happen with other, like, other types of assets and whatnot, that once there's a framework built out and you have you know, major exchanges like yeah. the CME or someone like that involved, it just it lends credibility to it that then eventually brings in the institutional volume. and Yeah, and, and I get it. I get yeah. why they won't do it until there's regulation. I 100% I believe in it. Um, but then you look at a company like Coinbase that is publicly traded here, uh, that is, is audited by a big four. Like, you know, they, their numbers are open. They have to. They're regulated. Yeah. They're regulated here in the United States where uh, FTX was not regulated. So their numbers, they, you know, they had, they had an accounting firm, which I'm not a very good accounting <laughs> we don't, yeah, firm. We don't know about yeah, like, I'm not quite sure about that accounting firm. I'm, I imagine they're out of business as well, because <laughs> I don't know who the hell's going to hire them. But, you know, Coinbase, and I'm not saying, again, go out and buy Coinbase, but if we come out of this, like I believe, and cryptocurrencies do become a major asset class in the next decade, Coinbase, I believe, is one of the best positioned companies out there because it is already regulated. And you know it, it doesn't have that high risk that some of these other uh, exchanges have taken or are still taking, you know, honestly. Yeah, no, so. that's a good point. And it, if they manage to survive this cycle, then they'll be even in a better position. Yes, we will see the survival of the fittest, the Darwinism come through, and the companies that make it through on the other side are going to flourish. And, and again, yeah. that's an opportunity for investors. It might be too early for you to do that. It might be too risky for some people, but I still think there's obviously great opportunity out there. All right, Drew, that wraps up our first five predictions. But at home, if you want to have all 10, and we're going to have the next five on Thursday, Drew's coming back, but if you want to have all 10 free of charge, go to McCallPredictions2023.com. Click on that, get the free report that we put together, my team, me and Drew and the rest of our team put it together. Again, McCallPredictions2023.com for the complete breakdown of our 10 predictions we're sharing for the next 12 months. Again, don't forget to join us on Thursday. For Drew McConnell, I'm Matt McCall. Thanks for watching Making Money. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansbury Research, its parent company, or affiliates.